uh, biosecurity and product integrity. Mm -hmm. Sarah, did you want to lead off there? Uh, yes. Chair, just before the oh, honourable member asks a question, could I just introduce Ray Burrows, who's come to the table? Ray is the General Manager of Biosecurity Tasmania. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Minister, I just wanted to go to the small hive beetle incursion. Yeah. Um, and if you could just talk through for the committee the process of um, when the first incursion was detected and, and what happened from that date on in terms of hive inspections. Um, so Tasmania um, really does have a world-class biosecurity system and it's never been better equipped to protect our state's health, industry and unique environment from pests and diseases. And this has been achieved through legislative change with the passing of the Biosecurity Act 2019 and funding initiatives including securing our borders. The recent detection of, um, of small um, hive beetle... Actually, I'm just going to take a step back. Mm. My information's about the second detection. Yes. Can you up to the first detection? We, I think we can. Through the state with that. Um, I'm just checking. Um, I think I might refer this straight um, to Ms Burrows, who was actually... <clears throat> Um, led our response team um, to the detection of the small hive beetle, the first detection. Thank you. Thanks, Ms Barrett. Thank you, Minister, and through, through you. The, the first detection of the... the no, sorry. The detection of the small, first small hive beetle in East Devonport was around about... And I haven't got the exact date in, my, in front of me, but it was March. It was um, early March. Um, as soon as we found that, it was actually found in a guard hive. And I'm not sure whether you're aware, but Tasmania has a um, set of surveillance hives around the whole state. Some of them are um, paid for by the Commonwealth, and they're called surveillance hives, and some of them are paid for by the Tasmanian government, which are guard hives. So this particular small hive beetle was found in a guard hive um, quite close to the East Devonport um, TT line terminal. As soon as that happened and was confirmed as a small hive beetle, um, we put in place a 15 kilometre, <coughs> excuse me, biosecurity risk management area. And we started um, checking every single hive within that 15 kilometre area from that point. How we did it was had a set of concentric zones, I suppose. So we started checking the hives in the 10 to um, 15 kilometre, 5 to 10, 10, and then 0 to 5. So we were going really well. Um, it got to uh, towards the end of April, and we hadn't fi found any more small hive beetle, and we thought, you beauty, this one's come on the, the <laughs> ferry and jumped into a guard hive, and we've, we've missed a, um, a crisis. But we found another one um, about probably 1.4 kilometres away from the first finding, um, and, and interestingly, probably about 500 metres away from the TT line terminal, but on the other side of the, the first finding. Um, by then, we'd actually uh, checked all the hives in that 10 kilometre, um, all the registered hives, all the recreational and commercial bee hives. So we started to check the um, bee colonies, the wild bee colonies. And that's the point we're at now. We've, got, we've reduced the biosecurity risk management zone to a 10 kilometre zone. And we are now working with the community to find every single wild colony we possibly can. Um, I'm very proud to say that my staff have door knocked about more than a thousand houses in that particular zone, mm. um, asking for people to keep their eyes open, don't approach. Um, they've also worked with the schools in the local area and similar sorts of things. So wild bee colonies are now our focus um, and we've developed a PCR test so that with those wild bee colonies, as you can appreciate, some of them are mm. quite high up in the trees mm. or might be in people's um, walls or, or whatever. We've developed a PCR test so we can actually get a scraping and have a reasonable understanding of whether or not small hive beetle is there or not. Okay. Um, Minister, can I just go back to the... when? So early March, the first 
uh, beta was detected in that guard hive and you said from when it was confirmed there was a risk management area set up and then by the end of April there had been no more, all of them had been checked and no more found. But can I just get a bit more of an idea of that timeline between that first detection? So first detection to um, when it was confirmed, so that timeline and then the establishment of that risk area um, and you mentioned there were sort of concentric circles, I guess, per perimeters, um, each, when each of those had been checked by? Mm -hmm. We certainly can. I think it's, um, it was pretty phenomenal mm -hmm. to watch our biosecurity team um, spring into action. Um, very, very quickly there mm -hmm. was a command centre um, mm -hmm. established, which um, I jumped straight in a car and raced up and had mm -hmm. a look at, and um, which was absolutely superb. Um, and so I think for the detailed aspects of that, I'll, I'll hand to Ms Burrows. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and through you. Um, the, the, the formal confirmation of the small hive beetle, it took three days. The PCR, mm. unfortunately, as you're probably aware, PCR test does take a little time but we were 90% sure that it was a small hive beetle. They're a fairly distinctive um, beastie. Mm. Um, and our entomologists were quite sure, but the confirmation came three days later. But by then we'd already set up the incident mm. management team. We set it up at our uh, Stony Rise offices um, and we immediately had the whole team in, in place. So mm. uh, operations, planning, incident controller and so forth. And I'm very pleased to say that there were some uh, sharing of resources across parks, for example, and EPA. They came in and helped us as well. Um, as far as your question about when each of the zones was, the surveillance on each was completed, I have to say I don't know the exact dates, um, but suffice it to say we had done all the hives in the 10 to, to 0 kilometre before that second small hive beetle was found, which was the beginning of May. Hmm. 2nd of May, I think it was, in fact. So we'd done all of those. Do you know how many hives there were in that zone? Yes, sign? I've actually got... So through you, Minister. Mm. Excuse me, Minister, through you. I apologise. Um, <coughs> has she got that? Yeah, I think you've got um, it. I've got the figures here. We've actually done 2,637 inspections in, since the initial dis, uh, detection. We've done an inspection intense inspection of 777 hives. So even though there was probably only, um, I do have that, we've got only 128 registered beekeepers in that particular zone, yeah. as you can probably appreciate, because registration of beekeepers was a fairly recent uh, requirement, it was November <coughs> last year, we are still having people that hadn't registered. So we only had 100, and, I think we had 100 people registered, now 128. Um, Is yes. that across the state or in that zone? <laughs> And what's the, what's the trigger then between, so you had a, the 2,637 inspections, 777 intense inspections. What's the trigger for an intense inspection? Through you, Minister. Um, an intense inspection are on the high-risk ones, for mm -hmm. example, if they were in close proximity, a physical proximity to the original hive where we found the small hive beetle. Um, they would be subject to an intense inspection. And, in fact, the ones that were immediately adjacent we closed them up mm. and put them in a freezer and actually hired a freezer van to actually take it down from Stony Rise down to our um, entomology labs in um, Launceston. Mm. So the idea of freezing, obviously, obviously you close the hive, freeze it, so you start to euthanise the bees mm. because our entomologists need to get in and actually have a really good look, you know. Mm pull it apart pretty much. Yep. And that's what we're also doing with the, the wild colonies that we can actually access as well. Um, there's a limited okay. number, same thing. We, we close them up and that might be spraying that magic... <laughs> What's that thing called? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Closing them up in, in some way, shape or form. agent. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it is something like that. And then putting it in a freezer, taking it back so our entomologists can have a good look at it. So that's yeah. that's intensive. Um, mm. The traps are actually deployed in... We, we've deployed how many traps? 456 traps within the hives. Most of the traps actually fit underneath the... Um, 
the business end of the mm -hmm. hive, so you can actually take those traps out without opening the hive. So that's a less intense. Mm. So how many okay. bees would have died as a result of well, this? Well, I was about to say, yeah, what yeah. do we know about the impact of the, this on the bee population in Tasmania would be? I don't know. Um, <laughs> through you, Minister. <laughs> um, it's, it's very difficult to assess. Mm. Um, we haven't killed a whole lot of bees in the, the recreational and commercial hives that we've checked to date. However, I'll be upfront, the, um, the wild colonies we are having to, to euthanise. Mm. It's, um, it's, not, it's not easy um, otherwise. Mm. And is that just within a radius? Yeah, is, and is so that the 10 15, kilometer 10 kilometres radius? Yeah. So did you close them up during the day when a lot of the bees were out or during the night when they were all home? Um, we would close... Because we were lucky in a lot of respects, the weather was cooling down anyway, so the bee activity was actually reducing quite significantly. But, yes, you're right. The closing up would happen when the bees were back into the, the hives at the early part of the season, but now, as I say, they're, they're mostly... They're really in their home anyway. Mm. Mm. Too cold to go out. Mm. Sarah? It can be really devastating for beekeepers. Mm. Mm. Some love mm. their bees. Mm. Bees. Mm. 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 Mm.
from May 2022 to May 23, the total number of flights coming into the state was 19,493, into Hobart 9,428, Launceston 5,183. Interestingly, the next highest is King Island, 1,854. Those golfers. <laughs> and the mine workers now. Really lifted it. Yeah. Winyard, 1399. Probably to King Island. Mm. And Ultimate, Ultimate, Ultimate Ultimate from Melbourne. Yep. Yeah, from Melbourne nicely. Um, Devonport, 1292, and Flinders Island, 337. So the number of those flights statewide that um, have been met by the, the dog handlers has been 10,215, or 52.4%. The flights met by a biosecurity inspector are 37.9. So as a total, we've met 91.3% um, of all the flights coming in. My apologies, 90.3% of all flights coming in statewide. With an inspector, not necessarily a dog? With both inspect, you know, either or. Yeah, OK. Do you have a breakdown of how many were met with a biosecurity dog? I do. Do you, Minister? That's right. Um, would you like that for each um, airport? Uh, yeah, if you've got it there, thank you. Okay. So the flights coming into Hobart that have been met by the dog handlers or the dog unit, mm -hmm. uh, 60, can I just, is it okay if I just say percentage? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, great. Thank you. 63.4% um, mm -hmm. into Launceston, 76.2%, into Devonport, 16.7%. Um, through you, Minister, if I can just say, uh, you might have... The Minister has just made a, an announcement that we'd get an, an additional um, handler in the northwest. Oh, that was one of yeah. our issues, that we didn't have total coverage in the northwest. So while that figure might seem quite small now, it will be rectified soonish. Mm -hmm. Wynyard 5.4, and the two islands... At this stage, we don't have dog handlers on the islands. They will go there on a um, rotating basis, but they're not there permanently. Um, flights met by a biosecurity inspector in Hobart, 22.5%. In Launceston, 15.4%. In Devonport, 82%. In Wynyard, 92.4%. King Island, 98.6%. Flinders Island, 87.5%. Great, thank you. Um, and how many dogs are currently in service across the state? Yep, we have that information. Thank you, Minister. And through you again. Um, fairly excitingly, we had uh, 12 dogs about six months ago. They were all reaching, they are all reaching their retirement age. Um, and we've just uh, brought in another six bred for purpose dogs in a range. Excuse me, in a range of breeds from, so not just beagles, but their short head mm -hmm. pointers and Labradors um, and Springer Spaniels, for example. They've been bred, as I say, as detect, detector dogs. Um, they're not, um, as previously you probably were aware, our beagles came from refuge centres. They weren't necessarily bred for purpose. Mm. They were very cute. Um, but, they, <laughs> but as I say, they came, a lot of them came to us with some. Issues mm. they had been, they were mm. in rescue centres. Yeah, so work. hence we have determined that it's much more efficient and effective and professional if we go for bread for purpose mm. dogs. So we now have five of these dogs have been training with our handlers for the last little while, four weeks or so. Um, uh, most of those, one of them seems a bit iffy. We've got the contract that um, we've arranged is if the dogs don't actually meet the needs of the handlers and they don't seem to be working out, we can get a swap dog. Okay. So we're at that point. So we're at the point where we've got... Um, um, I think we've got... We've got a number of our beagles mm -hmm. that are still uh, are working and we've got these five new dogs that are coming, starting to come in. We will get... Uh, some more before the end of 2023 mm -hmm. and we'll also get the last of our 14 new dogs early next um, calendar year. So we're in a phase process yep. now. So as the current dogs are retiring you'll, they'll be replaced by That's the new dogs? Yeah. Okay. What is the retirement age for a biosecurity dog? 
Um, for you, Minister? Just out of curiosity. It's about it's nine. Course, it's about oh. eight or nine. OK, that's older than I expected. A long time, isn't it? Time off for good behaviour. Yes. Are you done? Thank you. Yeah, thank this you. This is here for um, animal welfare too, as I understand it. So just, it may be easier to take these on notice to provide later, Mr. Just in view of the time. But I'll have a go. Yeah. So how many animal welfare checks in agricultural settings, including dairy, beef, cattle, beef, cattle, sheep and pigs, have been undertaken? Sure. Just up to I'll follow up and say that why they're looking for that are information. They all in the same sort of category. <coughs> Your questions are all about that data. Yeah, broken yeah. down by species, if you like, right? Or animal. Um, and yeah. how many infringements or direct directions have been issued, and what do yeah. those matters relate to? We have that information. Yeah. We can well, give that um, in terms of inspections, um, I. I think it would, I don't believe I've got that information for you, Minister. We have that information, or that it'll be readily accessible. We can talk about how the system works, our resourcing. We've got some good information about what our resourcing looks like. In terms of Animal Welfare um, Act infringements, um, uh, up to 31st of May 2023, three infringements, 17 caution letters. Yep, and that's what, under the animal what welfare. What do they relate to? Um, I don't believe I've got that information on um, to hand through you, Minister. Through you, Minister, I do have that information. Um, some of them are still under yeah, we investigation, not, and actually, we're not able oh, to right. fold yeah, think, that sort of information. Yeah, because infringements through you, Minister, can be appealed. appealed yeah, so yeah. Um, perhaps we leave it through you, Minister, yeah. if we could leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. So this is where the funding for the RSPCA also sits. Uh, some well, of where it, does yes. the funding for the RSPCA yeah, some sit? Of it, some of it is. Yeah, so how, so what, how does the RSPCA get its funding then? Get some from you and where else? Mm -hmm. So the... <coughs> Sorry, you go. Yes, so the RSPCA has received over $800,000 um, this year, $550,000 for um, an inspectorate, that's for core funding, mm -hmm. 28500 uh, to promote our animal welfare regulations, um, $50,000 for safety equipment and a vehicle um, for the inspectorate, that's new funding, $200,000 to support the new racing integrity model, um, and this funding will support access to an investigation management system for the RSPCA Animal Welfare Officers to align with the Office of Racing Integrity and Biosecurity Tasmania, um, fund uh, modernising memorandum of understanding between the RSPCA and other relevant animal welfare regulators in Tasmania, and analysis of options in respect to the lifetime tracking of greyhound, improvement of adoption processes, and to augment linkages to local government areas. I just want to seek some advice. So when, when I mention, you know, mm. that some of the funding comes through me, that's an example of where that money is actually coming through the racing mm. portfolio. Mm. Well, At that two hundred thousand yeah. dollars, that came from the racing portfolio. Yeah, yeah, for the new racing integrity model. And you provide the base funding. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this one? If not, we'll go to um, seven point three natural values management, Nick. Oh, sorry, is that Nick? No, it's um, Luke, sorry. Uh, oh, no, I, look, I'm happy to keep moving. If these, yeah, I can put questions. Can I just go and ask one question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Minister, did you have something to provide? I've just got some information that I wanted to um, table, which is in answer to um, some of the earlier questions. Um, so this is um, the breakdown of the gender mm -hmm. uh, numbers around the different um, positions. So I okay. hand that one to you. And this is... Um, Oh, so this is um, this is the um, female male bio. Okay. And so this is the um, information that we needed to just take out what was um, oh, uh, under primary industries. Yeah. Yeah. So Thanks. that's a new table Thank you. Um, that has that information Thanks very much. there. Um, I did think this might be coming, but you can do that even under another portfolio area, Minister. That's just through engaging. 
Yes, oh, right, you got that? Yeah, you can go. Strain, uh, the strain gauging sites, you mm -hmm. asked for a breakdown yep. of that. River so health health monitoring sites. sites. That one, uh, the river health monitoring sites. Mm -hmm. So this is the information yes, of the... Yes. Uh, yep. Yep. And this is the um, this is the Welcome River, the just um, raw data information that we've got on Welcome River pH. Yeah, okay. Um, that's all, that's what we've got about it at the moment, no analysis. Yes. This is right to the Welcome River. Mm. Yep. Thank you. And Sarah, did you say this was on this Oh, just a clarifying question. Um, voluntary land conservation covenants, is that under this line, or does this come under a different minister? Um, yes, it's something there's always been a bit of yeah, uncertainty yeah. about. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's under um, parks Yench. for parks. Oh, voluntary or land conservation. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, it's not you. That's all I need yes, to know. Sorry, really, it's not fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm good. Uh, I've got to come here um, again. I'm very conscious of the time, but. I understand the natural values reports, and I've had a look at some that are online, enable multiple data sets which can be incorporated into the national natural values report. A couple I just want to mention is that the raptor nest locations. My question is related to that is how does this output group work with or assist volunteers such as Adam Hardy at Raptor, raptor Care Northwest to collect some cares for injured raptors? And how does you know, your work in this output group interact with TAS networks to help prevent raptor deaths? But so, I think that's a really nice for environment because it's a really endangered species. Um, I thought you also threatened species too. Though, we're we're wildlife, wildlife, we're wildlife management. Yeah. Threatened species is um, Minister Yench. Oh, is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm 12. All right. I'll go over the top. Yeah, just to make sure I'm correct yeah. through you, Minister. Let's Can I just take some advice? advice. I'm, I'm, I believe I'm correct, but let's just make sure. So, hi, Joe. Um, Chair, could I please introduce to the table the General Manager for Environment, Joe Chris. So, you might not know that, so that was around Raptor, natural values assets, assets, base, and Raptor Ness, um, 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 which goes into natural values asset and what role we'd have as part of this portfolio. I was, I was thinking that that's probably not going to be because it's in the line of the species, but I wanted to be Yes, that's right, that is environment. Yeah, three in three what, So uh, in 7.3 that sits in your portfolio, Miss, so what do you actually cover? Is that the wild, that's wildlife? Yes. Three wildlife management. Mm. So, but not threatened species? No, threatened species correct. is the Minister for Environment. Mm. Right, so if, a, if there's um, raptors interacting with power lines and you know, um, and in, in vehicles, that doesn't, you don't have any oversight over that? No, I'm advised that's Minister Yench. Oh, sorry, Minister for Environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I thought that was under 7.4, threatened species. Uh, through you, Minister, threatened species is Minister Yench. Yeah. That's what I thought, yes. Yeah. This is 7.3, but... All right. Um, did you want to introduce, sorry? Are you, um, yeah, just, I think oh, you did, did you? Sorry, yeah, I was yeah, yeah, reading. Yes, sorry. Okay. So the, if we then go to, well, this might not even, I don't know what happened under here. Geodiversity sites, are they this area? Geodiversity, Geodiversity is normally Minister Yanch, but... Is there a question? Where are the identified geodiversity sites and what qualifies as a site as geodiverse? This, this is a question for... Through you, Minister. Yes. This is a question uh, for the Environment Portfolio and Minister Yanch. I don't know why it doesn't um, have 7.3 all up then. Um, prescribed burning advice, same. Some identified biosecurity risk. That must be you. So what? It, it, this is this is what it's outlined in the report. I looked at online mm -hmm. on, on your website. Mm -hmm. So what are the other biosecurity risks? Or is that what we've already talked about under... I just can't understand what this line item's for, then, um, if everything in it seems to be Minister Yench's issue. So Minister Yench uh, has protected sites under the environment portfolio, mm. which I think is perhaps what you're referring to in those 
questions. Can you so expand the, on that? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll ask the Deputy Secretary to comment. How about I start at the first principles about what the Minister is responsible yeah, for? Yeah, well, the, the $11.189 million appropriation here, what, what are we... Yep. So, um, under the Nature Conservation Act and the regs, um, Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. But um, most of the portfolio um, responsibilities under the Nature Conservation Act sit um, with the Minister for Environment, except um, wildlife regulations, um, which covers things like um, property protection permits, deer, um, game management, um, and it's, um, if you look at the Ministry of Arrangement Order, um, I think it's Section 78 and the regs sit with um, this minister. Um, but the deer coal had nothing to do with this minister either. That was parks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that doesn't, that's because um, that's where that um, funding came through in terms of the Commonwealth and Australian Government funding. Um, um, but um, if any, if they needed any approvals, for example, they would have come into and got those approvals from other parts of the agency. If I missed any of the activities, so wildlife interactions, including um, seals, mm. um, and wildlife rehabilitation. Through you, Minister. Yeah, yes. Okay, so wildlife rehabilitation. Okay, so yeah. let's go yes. back to the to Adam Hardy at Raptor Care North West. That's wildlife rehabilitation. He collects injured raptors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, does it as an entirely volunteer mm -hmm. um, approach. So is there any support available to someone like that? He does really important work around our state. Through you, Minister. Yeah, thank you very um, much, Joe. Yes. Um, I, first of all, I'd just like to draw your attention to the support that the government has provided to the sector through the um, strategy that was developed um, over the course of the last 12 months and um, was released last year. So there is a wildlife rehabilitation strategy and action plan which identifies the priority areas for um, the sector to support and um, work with uh, the various member groups and individuals. And through that strategy, the government's provided um, funding support and um, that funding support is um, $115,000 over, uh, over four years. Um, and, but importantly, that has also led to a uh, very strong partnership with WIRES. Now, WIRES um, is... Um, has do most interactions with WIRES, not peers. So, oh, no. No, no. No, no. 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 Um, so, I thought uh, that too when I it, but it's an acronym. No. So, WIRES um, is the Wildlife Information Rescue and Education Services Organisation originally based in New South Wales, but they have a state a national um, imprimatur and are doing quite a lot of work in Tasmania. Um, that they've been funded through funding that was provided through the major bushfires on the mainland, and they're doing some very good work. So they have um, grant programs that they provide to rehabilitators, and they're being um, implemented in the state. So small they grants... They can provide funding to people. That's right, they can. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to provide some more information um, to, that can be provided to um, rehabilitators and, and people doing work in this space. Mm -hmm. OK. I know we're, we're actually past our time, but we'll mm -hmm. try and at least get to these last couple. 90.3 um, seafood industry growth and recovery. Nick? Thank you, Chair. And... I know that we have, uh, there is no funding going forward, but it's worth uh, uh, making the point, I guess, and I think you probably have some comments around. Um, the jewel hits the seafood industry took around COVID and also the disruption to some major markets. Um, and perhaps you could outline the support government provided there. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, the Wild Fisheries Action Plan is a $2 million election commitment to support businesses in the wild caught seafood industry that have been affected by COVID-19 and other market um, disruptions. A key delivery under the Wild Fisheries Action Plan was the Seafood Processor Grants Program. Uh, through two successful rounds of this program, 17 seafood processing businesses have installed new processing infrastructure, increased their value added capabilities, provided further training for staff and developed uh, new products. So a total of $1.2 million has been committed to these 17 seafood processing businesses through individual grants of up to $80,000. Um, several projects are ongoing with all funds scheduled to be paid out and projects completed by the 30th of June 2023. Now the projects funded um, include support to purchase infrastructure to chill, freeze and maintain a product quality for a high-grade premium frozen rock lobster product, support to develop self-stable ready-to-eat abalone product for supermarket retail, uh, support in upgrading infrastructure to enable improved product quality and facilitate agritourism, and support to purchase vacuum sealing machines, modified atmosphere packaging machines, and branded packaging to develop value-added products and new um, access some new markets. Important rock lobster processors representing the majority of the state's rock lobster industry by value and volume signalled that this uh, timely government support enabled them to continue servicing commercial fishers during ongoing market disruptions and avoid closing their doors for many weeks um, with full live tanks resulting in further reductions in beach prices and more uncertainty for fishers and more pressure on local markets. Other seafood processing businesses have detailed similar outcomes. Uh, the Wild Fisheries Action Plan has also delivered funding to the Tasmanian Seafood Industry Council, $100,000 over two years to deliver a maritime safety education program. Um, this will support fishers to maintain compliance safety management systems, provide seafood industry input into the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, Tasmanian Regional Safety Committee and other consultation processes. There was $150,000 to continue the Eat More Tassie Seafood Campaign, covering a range of marketing activities to promote our wild-caught seafood, including the involvement of high-profile chefs and a rather popular presence at the 23 Australian Wooden Boat Festival. So in light of Sorry to interrupt success, you. Um, we are running short of time. As there is no budget allocation... Oh, you're just about finished, Rodeo. In light of the success of the Wild Fisheries Action Plan, this government has committed a further $250,000 a year over the next two years to this important initiative. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much for the answer. We'll move then. Um, I know we're out of time. Um, I just ask, is there any questions on grants and subsidies? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on capital investment, I do have one regarding the truck washers. Um, are you happy if I send that to you on, on notice? No, I'll try and answer it now. Well, with the, the truck washers, are, as I understand it, are a, um, a joint funded initiative with the Commonwealth Government. Um, so, can you um, inform us as to which ones these relate to, the funding, uh, under the capital investment program here? Um, mm. Yes, thank you, Chair, and I'll um, pass to the Deputy Secretary. Um, through you, Minister, the um, funding that um, is in the, um, the State Government budget is for um, um, state projects, um, so that um, has um, supported... Um, Parana, um, and um, the next one we're looking to fund in partnership with the Cradle Coast Authority, the Australian Government, um, and the landowner is and Taswater is the, at uh, Smifton. I believe you may be referring to the. Um, there's a set of other projects that have been um, announced. That's fully federally funded. Um, the island one's fully federally funded. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we've provided. Um, um, advice um, to the Cradle Coast Authority um, into their project, but that is a project um, that um, um, sits with the Cradle Coast Authority. Mm. Mm -hmm. Any others on capital investment? Okay, if we have um, Mast, you want, not Mast, you mean Fisheries. Fisheries. Mm. You mean Fisheries? Yep.
Uh, Chair, I will introduce um, John Dill to the table, who is the Director of Inland Fisheries Services. Over to you when he's settled. Sorry? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, and <coughs> Minister, uh, I think this is the third year in a row I've asked this question, but the Tasmanian Carp Eradication Program, uh, one of the pin-up programs across the world, John, um, and I'm just after an update for where we are with this important project and how it's moving. Yes, well, um, as you would know, European carp is an invasive species widespread on mainland Australia and it is a controlled fish under the Inland Fisheries Act of 95. The carp management program commenced when carp were found in Lake Crescent in February of 95 and in Lake Sorrel soon after. Now, the program has been extremely um, important for our environment and for our angling community. If it had been left unchecked in Tasmanian inland waters, carp would have, um, could have had devastating consequences for our diverse array um, of native freshwater uh, flora and fauna, some of course which is actually endangered. Um, it would also pose a major risk to our recreational angling industry and commercial fishery which are significant to our economy. So the carp management program successfully eradicated carp from Lake Crescent in 2009 with the last specimen having been caught in the lake in 2007. Over the last 28 years approximately $12.4 million of state government funding and approximately $2.8 million of federal funding has uh, been contributed to the control program. Approximately 49,300 carp have been removed from the lakes over this time and certainly delighted to announce that um, I've been advised um, by IFS that there are no fertile male carp left in Lake Sorrel. And this has been verified through independent assessment um, by the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies, IMAS. So this comes on the back of targeted surveys of the lake since 2013 which failed to detect any juvenile carp um, despite a series of years when there have been um, ideal environment conditions um, for spawning. So we will continue to be vigilant through a well-structured and coordinated monitoring program to confirm um, there is no uh, recruitment and I am... I'm cautiously optimistic um, that with no reproductive population left in the lake, um, we'll be able to announce full eradication of carp from Tasmanian waters in the not too distant future. Um, in addition to monitoring, I'm also advised that IFS will undertake targeted education campaigns to prevent the reintroduction of this invasive species into Tasmania. And I would have to take this opportunity to acknowledge the incredible dedication and the commitment um, and the work from inland fisheries that has gone into this. This is a, um, a tremendous outcome. I'm not sure it's ever been done anywhere else in the world, has it? Um, thank you. Appreciate the question. Um, uh, and as we're saying, Minister, inland fisheries, uh, trout fishing is a favourite pastime for many Tasmanians. I'm just wondering if you could provide an update on what the government's doing in support of this uh, pastime. Yeah, well, as you say, some of the world's best wild brown trout fisheries and their lakes and waterways are enjoyed by thousands of Tasmanians um, and visitors, of course. Um, in recent years, as part of our plan to encourage more people to go trout fishing, we've built and upgraded amenities at popular inland fishing locations, expanded our anglers' access program across high-priority waterways and supported angling events and clubs. Um, building on these successes, this government is continuing to deliver. We're implementing a $1 million election commitment with $250,000 allocated each year over four years um, and this will enable to continue focus on improved access to anglers and on new and upgraded um, facilities. So the Inland Fisheries Service has been working in partnership with Anglers Alliance Tasmania and local angling clubs to deliver this commitment across priority lakes and rivers in the northwest and northeast Derwent catchments. I think we do need to call it quits there because we've got over time, so thank you. Um, I won't be pinching any further on your women's portfolio, but short enough time as it is. So um, thank you, Minister. You can, um, we'll just stop the broadcast. <laughs> Okay, um, well, thank you, Minister. Welcome back. If you'd like to introduce the term of the table, we'll move into the um, women's policy portfolio area. Yes, absolutely. I would like to introduce Jenny Dale, 
uh, Jenny is the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet. I also have um, Courtney Herworth, the Acting Deputy Secretary, Community Partnerships and Priorities. And also joining us today is Brett Noble, Acting Director, Community Policy and Engagement. Excellent. Did you want to make an opening comment about yes. um, women's, women's portfolio? Yes, I would. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, in recognition of the deep history and the culture of this island, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, the past and present custodians of the lands and the waters upon which we meet and gather. We pay respect to and we acknowledge the strength of Aboriginal women as the caregivers, nurturers, gatherers, cultural leaders and storytellers and for their wisdom to lead their families. And can I pay my deepest respects to Elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the amazing women and men around this table who I get to work with every day and who I learn so much from. I know budget estimates um, can be adversarial uh, process, um, but it is an important one for holding government to account. But despite our different affiliations, I want to acknowledge that all of the women in this place are amazing representatives of their communities, wonderful role models for Tasmanian women and girls. I'd also like to acknowledge our male colleagues who are such great allies in our progress towards a truly gender equal Tasmania. I would also like to congratulate the member for Murchison on her motion to establish a joint sessional committee on gender and equality, and I'm very proud it was supported by the Rockcliffe Liberal Government. This committee is fundamental in establishing mechanisms for women. It demonstrates that genuine efforts are being made, and we are already seeing some of those changes. Chair, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the former and current members of the Tasmanian Women's Council. The Tasmanian Women's Council has been instrumental in the development and delivery of so much of the work of the women's portfolio after the over the last 12 months, and of course for a number of years before that. I want to thank each member for their generous insights, their expertise and their ideas. Chair, I'm also proud this year that we have an opportunity to talk about our new Tasmanian Women's Strategy 22 to 27, Equal Means Equal. In many ways, our new strategy is a call to action and a reminder that whilst we have come a long way towards gender equality in Tasmania, we still have a way to go. The strategy reflects the voices, perspectives and priorities of Tasmanian women. Women shared with us that the priorities of our previous strategy, health, safety and well-being, leadership and participation and economic security are still fundamental priorities for Tasmanian women. Equal Means Equal reflects these priority areas but takes a step forward and strengthens our approach as outlined in previous strategies. An important action in Equal Means Equal is the delivery of our gender budget snapshot and I anticipate the committee may have questions around this. This year's snapshot is another step forward in our understanding of how government investment can support gender equality. Next year, we will, for the first time, be implementing an end-to-end -end gender analysis of the budget. And this will involve analysis of some policy and budget initiatives while in development, as well as analysis of budget investments after the budget has been released. The Tasmanian Government has been proud to invest over $4 million since 2020-21 in initiatives to support gender equality in Tasmania. One such initiative is to share the stories of Tasmanian women from all walks of life. This year, for International Women's Day, we partnered with Brand Tasmania to develop a screen piece and stories about 17 Tasmanian women. We will be releasing more stories over the coming year, and so I ask uh, that you think about the women in your lives, the networks, who might be willing to share their own unique stories more broadly. Our work is not done until Tasmanian women are truly equal, and this requires looking at the collective set of obstacles that affect women for no other reason than because they are women. I'm confident our new strategy and the actions it supports will do this and lead to sustained change over the long term. Um, Chair, I look forward to questions in this portfolio. Thanks. I'll go to Sarah first. You've got, you've got... Uh, yeah, I can. Yep. Um, <coughs> so, Minister, could you provide the uh, committee with an update on women on boards? Um, we've talked about this over the last couple of years and just interested in a comparison of those numbers from last year to this year. Uh, 
Um, the information that I have here is as to the 30th of March 2023. Um, women hold 46.4% of position on boards, government, uh, tas sorry, on Tasmanian government boards and committees. Women held 49% of paid positions, so 285 out of the 580 that were paid positions, women held 49% um, of those. Um, it certainly is so important that we continue to strive for gender equality at all levels of society and most crucially in positions of leadership and decision making. Uh, we have made great progress in the representation of uh, women on Tasmanian government boards and committees. Um, in June of 2015, women only held 34% of positions on boards and committees, um, so it is good to see that there has been that increase. Um, as I said before, and I, th I think this is really important to stress, that um, we are actually seeing 49% of those positions paid through annual fees or sitting fees. Um, so as I said before, 285 out of the 580 positions. This is a significant achievement um, and that can be attributed to our strategy uh, for women on boards. And we're determined to continue working towards gender equity on our boards and our committees. I can say that we are currently undertaking a review um, of actions and strategies to address the barriers to gender equality and to further increase uh, the numbers that um, I've presented today. Um, for example, we are taking a fresh look at our women on board strategy and considering actions that could be um, strengthened to further propel achievement of that target. Um, this strategy contains practical actions to support women to join government boards and committee and to support boards uh, to increase increase then their gender diversity. Thank you. So it looks like there's been, and I, I appreciate they're very minor, but still a, a downward shift over previous years. So I think a couple of years ago it was 47.9%. Last year, 47.2%. Now we're down to 46.4%. So I'm pleased to hear that there's a review of that strategy in place. At, at, where are you up to with that review? Is that just starting, or do you have any idea of what that might include? or what might come out of that review. I'll, I'll pass to Ms Herworth. Thank you. Um, through you, Minister. Um, I would say we're probably about a quarter of the way into looking at what we're doing. I just want to be really clear, the review is going to look not only at what we need to do to help women to be skilled, to get onto boards, but... Um, and perhaps this is a bit of a change in direction from what we've had before. It's also going to look at the culture of boards themselves. Um, so practical things like... Um, meeting times. Meeting times, mm, meeting great. locations, but also bias in the way boards make decisions. Um, and we're looking at... Um, uh, for the new uh, Women's Scholarships Program, a stream around upskilling boards to understand their own bias mm. um, in terms of how they think about the recruitment of people onto boards. Great. Uh, and do you have a breakdown, for um, Minister, for the n number of women on boards? In previous years, we've got a breakdown of um, distinct individuals, if I can term it that way, just so we, we get an idea that we're not just making sure that you're not having same the same the woman on all the boards and that makes up your 50%. <laughs> and those numbers have been good in previous years, I'll add, but just mm -hmm. making sure we've got that still. OK. So looking at women on Tasmanian government boards, um, members on more than one board, there's 41 women and 51 men. And that's 41 out of quite a high... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was saying, do you want to go on those on more than two boards or two or more boards? Yeah. That's, that, was two, that was two boards? So members on more than one board, there's 41 women and there's 51 men. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to get a breakdown for how many are on two, how many are on three, how many are on four? Um, which we have done in the past... for you before the end of the session. Sure. And can I ask, it's 41 out of how many board members total? Because I'm not, there's... So there's 452 women um, on government boards. Thank you. And so 41 of that 452 are on two or... Sorry, on one... one or no, more. Two, more than more one, one board. Yeah. More than one board. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
Question. Um, yeah, just on on the board matter still. Uh, no, after the board matter. So, Back yeah. to opening comment. So have you? Yeah, have you got um, details of the chair positions? How many women are um, chair boards or committees? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I have thirty-three women who are chairs, mm -hmm. and I have 73 men as chairs. So we've still got a little way to go there. Mm -hmm. um, paid positions? Were you gonna gonna, yeah, I was going to go to the paid positions. Um, of the pay, of the 49% that are in paid positions, you said they were across, they, were, they included annual... Um, Receiving annual, fees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, um, so city fees are obviously quite a, a lot less than you know, the annual um, payment. So have you got a breakdown of how many of those mm -hmm. women are, receive annual payments and how many uh, receive sitting fees? I have got both of those mm -hmm. um, figures here. So members receiving annual fees, women 147, men 154. Sitting fees. Members receiving sitting fees, women 140 and men 153. Okay. I also have unpaid, do you want yeah, to... If you've got unpaid, that's yeah. right, yeah. Unpaid members, 160 women, 211 men. Okay. Is it, did it all... That's all I have for boards. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, just busy for a minute, mm -hmm. just give a minute. Stem. So I have been given a list of the actual names of women and the number of boards and the boards that they are on. Uh, this information is also uh, men mm -hmm. on multiple government boards yep. and committees. Again, the name yep. of the man and the number of boards and committees and the names of those committees. Um, would you like me to yep. table that? That would be great. Minister, you've done very well with mm. <laughs> the data. Mike. Yeah, thank you, Minister. In your um, preamble, you mentioned four million dollars for gender strategy or something. Can you go back to the comment you made there? I just didn't. You mentioned the figure four million dollars for something towards the end of it, I think. Oh, yes, so um, we've invested over $4 million since 2020 to 21, uh, since the 2021 budget in initiatives to support gender equality in Tasmania. Okay, that's fine. Could you um, provide a, a breakdown of that $4 million that you've done in to support gender equality in Tasmania? Could you provide that to the, to the committee? At, at, obviously not now, but you may be able to do that on notice. What's been delivered under that for that month? Yeah, what yeah, the four million. Um what how's that been delivered? Yeah, what programs? Um yes we do have that information and uh, I'll hand to Miss um to Miss um Herworth to do that. Um, so, what we have under, it's over four million over okay. the board, so yep. bear with me as I go through this. Um, it's 400,000 ending in 2023-24, so 100,000 per annum for the Women's Leadership Scholarships Program, 20,000 per annum ending in 24-25 for the International Women's Day Small Grants Program, uh, one million for supporting women to succeed, women's workforce participation, 2.5 million uh, from 2020 to 2021 um, for supporting women to succeed, women's <coughs> workforce participation, uh -huh. $400,000 to 2022-23 20, um, for the industry liaison officer 
role in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, 75,000 for women in building and construction and 25,000 for the girls in property pilot. Okay. And, and that's the level of detail you Yeah, no, that's to. fine. And you called it the $4 million, what did you call it, agenda something? Um, in my comments, I said the Tasmanian government has been proud to invest over $4 million since 2020-21 in initiatives to support gender equality in Tasmania. So let's name it up. It's to support women becoming more and more uh, equal, I suppose. So, so it's it's a women's equality um, framework, I think, more so than a gender support. Um, and I'm, I, you know that where I'm coming from here, yeah. and that's fine because no issues with that at all. But it is. Um, It'll be interesting when I ask another question about what's included yeah. for men. Yeah. I, and I understand your role as Minister for Women. Yeah. And um, and I, I do... I know where you're coming from and I appreciate your comments, um, but I think when you look at the key indicators um, across so many aspects of society where we see the inequality, um, it is... Um, the fact where women are disadvantaged for no other reason than the fact that they are a woman. Oh, and totally so agree. these initiatives, um, when we talk about gender equality, um, it's, it's well established in the data, as I say, across so many indicators um, that there is an imbalance, um, whether that's um, safety and wellbeing, certainly economically, you only have to look at, you know, what's happening with superannuation um, and health outcomes. We know that the inequality the quality there is is that women are disadvantaged. In so health all outcomes. of these strategies are in health outcomes? Mm -hmm. In health outcomes, in well being and safety, in economics, um, and a, a number of those indicators are actually set out um, in the gender budget snapshot. Okay, thank you. So if you Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Minister I know there's a the um, output group here drops away quite significantly, the funding over the years. I know part of that's related to the um, development of the um, equal means equal um, strategy that you've referred to. Um, I'm just concerned that you know, it drops away. This year there's $659,000. <clears throat> um, next year, 310000 and the next out year is only $191,000. Um, I'm just interested in um, how you're going to make the... Yeah, the ongoing work that's going to be needed to actually get to a position of gender equality with such little funding. <coughs> Yeah, certainly. Um, look, the Tasmanian Women's Strategy commits to an evaluation of the strategy and the impact of investment and initiatives on Tasmanian women's lives in Equal Means Equal. Um, the result of this evolution, um, the results of this evolution are due in 2026 and will inform future funding initiatives um, in future strategies and across the women's portfolio. Um, we are deeply committed uh, to equality for women, um, which is why we are taking taking an evidenced-informed approach um, to investment and um, policy design. We don't want to assume that what we've always done, mm. um, we just keep doing. So there is a body of work um, that I will get Ms Hurtworth to um, talk to. can understand what, what's going to be done in this coming this, you know, budget year we're looking at, um, with the $660,000, basically. What, what will be done with that? Appropriation. Yes, yes, okay. Um, so while we're getting the breakdown of that money, I think this is um, is it a really fantastic opportunity to talk about um, some new work that um, is going to be done. OK, so from the funding allocation uh, to deliver equal means equal, $200,000 of that will be directed to the delivery of an evaluation framework. Now, this is to develop uh, a framework that we... Uh, sorry, to develop this evaluation framework. We're entering into a partnership with the University of Tasmania, uh, the Institute of Social Change. Um, activities include developing publicly available domains and indicators, developing and collecting data sets, and measuring 
measuring outcomes for women and girls against the focus areas of the equal means equal um, strategy, that being safety, health and wellbeing, economic security and leadership and participation. So this partnership, which is with UTAS and ISC, being the Institute for Social Change, includes um, the Department of Premier and Cabinet as the lead agency responsible uh, for delivering Equal Means Equal and the Department of State Growth as the agency responsible for delivering the Population Strategy 2.0. So UTAS is strongly placed to provide and deliver the evaluation framework in partnership um, with our government um, with knowledge and access to information relating to social change data capture, data analytics, statistics and communications. Um, the indicators developed will assist in refining the indicators in the gender budget snapshot um, and the framework will enable a detailed evaluation of whether our investments and our initiatives are progressing gender equality in Tasmania. I think that with a lot of the strategies um, that have been in place for a number of years, um, we get incredible feedback mm. about it. Um, we know that we feel good about them, mm. um, but it's it's taking it to that, ne that next level. It's getting that extra layer of information that says, is there a real outcome when we know that women can see other women achieving? So should we be putting more money into the Tasmanian honour roll, um, the stories of Tasmanian women? Or are there more outcomes when we're investing in getting women upskilled in leadership? Mm -hmm. Are there better outcomes for gender equality when we do that? So that's what we're looking at. We're trying to get that next level of information um, that will actually really guide us in our budgeting to say, you know what, here's where we're getting real um, bang for buck here and so we need to look at what other strategies can we have in that place or do we just need to better resource that strategy and what are the areas that might make us feel good but it's actually not really having an outcome yeah. um, in people's homes, in our schools, in our workplaces and maybe that, you know, we might need to rethink some of those. So I think this is an exceptionally important body of work um, to make sure that we are actually getting those real outcomes and it is actually... Um, changing changing our community and changing the lives of women rather than just going, oh, this is a great strategy, makes me feel really good, but we're not really sure if there's a change that happens outside of that particular strategy. Before I go to the figures, if I might, who's led right to the next question, and you're singing a song about you know, outcomes measures. OK, so it's really great to hear that some of the money, and I'm sure that it will be informed further, would develop the framework with the Institute of Social Change and UTAS. Yeah. Um, to look at those, how are we going to measure outcomes from this? And I'm really pleased to hear that. And you also said it would inform the, um, the gender budget snapshot. You also said, I think, in your um, opening comments about putting an end-to-end -end gender analysis mm -hmm. over the budget, so um, which I would call gender budgeting. Um, it's a well-defined term or, you know, and, it, it, and been used around many jurisdictions. So um, I guess I'm just, I'll be more just, I'll, I'll be interested to hear further about how you intend to apply it to this, mm -hmm. to the gender budget snapshot for next year, and how we'll see the measures um, and perhaps um, yeah, this is sort of like a starting point, if you like, and it's much better than what we had last year. So I commend last you. Last year was the starting point. Yeah, I know. This is yeah, so this is this is uh, rung uh, one yeah, on no, the ladder. No, no. We're on the ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't disagree with you on that. But how do we see progress? How do we see outcomes measures reflected in this as well? So um, that's okay. and it may be the work that's going to be done. Um, but I just wonder how it might look next yeah. year. So there's two questions yeah. before me at the moment. Um, where would you like to start? Would you like to address that question and then perhaps we'll go to the breakdown of the 800,000? Yeah. yeah. Um, through the Minister. Um, so with the gender budget snapshot, it's, part, it's one third of a three part integrated approach. Um, the, what we did this year, um, when we say end-to-end, -end, as you would well know, you can look at policy design through a gender lens and then you can assess decisions once they're made through a gender lens. What we did this year is that latter part. Mm. We assessed budget initiatives based on gender once the decision was made, but there'd been no systemic gender lens applied to those decisions before they had entered into the budget process. Mm. From next year, we'll be using a gender impact assessment toolkit to inform the design of policy 
in spending initiatives before they even um, be become decided, and then we'll be able to look at them on the other mm -hmm. side for their gender impacts. We're well, using a, an or through your minister um, an already um, designed tool, or you're developing your own tool. Um, through you, Minister, we took um, a tool that was based on the Victorian model and we tested it with Homes Tasmania um, and we found it to be really difficult to apply and overly bureaucratic. And it, whilst it might have led to a gender impact assessment on paper, it didn't change any of the attitudes of the people that were actually developing the policy. Um, so it didn't address their own um, bias. They still thought that housing was a gender neutral topic. Um, so we've actually commissioned some expertise to help us um, take, uh, we've done a scan of, of the relevant ones across jurisdictions and internationally to take the best from those and then um, make our own Tasmanian tool. Um, and the difference with ours and others will be that it includes case studies of how government policy have impacted actual people's lives, actual women's lives. Okay, so um, you'll develop your own. If you had to, I think, you know, through your minister, um, she said that um, there'll be, uh, you took some expert advice. Mm -hmm. Is that funded out of this money? Yeah. yeah. So should I go yeah. to yeah, the... Yeah, maybe it's a problem to go to that. that yeah. Yeah. Is that Little <laughs> okay. Um, so through you, Minister. Um, so for um, 22-23, um, we spent $140,000 on the gender budget snapshot, um, 50000 on the evaluation framework, um, and 50000 on what we're describing as the toolkit, which is the assessment process, and um, 65000 on other activities such as communications, women's stories project, etc. Next year, that will um, there'll be no expenditure on the gender budget statement because Treasury will take the lead in undertaking that activity. Yes, they'll use their resources to do it. Um, the evaluation framework will be 50 gender impact assessment, and then that flows over the forwards 50 and then support activities. We also have 700,000 in this year for women's workforce participation, 100,000 for scholarships, 20,000 for International Women's Day grants, and that could be sort of... Mm. Mm. Okay. Do you have any other questions here you want to go to? Um, no, I think I'm okay, actually. I have some other questions. Yeah, there. Sure yeah. Um, look, just um, comment here. I received a question from an organisation saying um, the process of providing a gendered analysis of the budget requires analysis of all policy measures, not just those intended to support women, with a gender lens to reflect on how they may impact different communities based on gender. So, um, how does the government intend to progress the process of future gender analysis of budgets and other measures? And how will gender equity be measured on an ongoing basis? Will targets be developed to help measure progress across all policies, not um, with, with a lens across the, the policy, not so much whether it's male or female? Um, but, uh, Thank you. I'll just seek some advice. Um, thank you very much for the question. I am going to um, pass to um, our Acting Deputy Secretary. Um, so through you, Minister, um, this year's budget snapshot didn't only look at measures targeted specifically towards women, so it looked at a selection of initiatives in the budget. It acknowledges it wasn't the full budget and it wasn't an end-to-end -end analysis. It is going to take... To do it properly and not in a tokenistic way, it is actually going to take some time to build capacity to do that across the whole budget, and that's what the gender impact assessment process that I was talking about earlier was, was mm -hmm. doing. In relation to targets, uh, what I can add on a factual level without going to the government's policy is that no state and territory has targets okay. at the moment. Um, they have targets for a number of SES positions in the public service, for example, that are women, which we also have, um, but they don't have high-level um, targets. Mm. 
uh, to do with budget measures. Look, I, thank you. I really there was some information here that I thought was really good, Minister. So that's fine. Um, and I think that it's great that the, there's a leadership pro process in. Mm -hmm in place for young women, young girls and women, as they become leaders in the community. Um, but I still think there's an inequity in that capacity for men to have a leadership program, for young men to actually go down that same path with those same opportunities. So in your role, um, what else do you need, believe needs to be done by government to correct that imbalance, um, and I and I look at envy when I see the. I think it was the young ladies in in schools coming to the and being spoken about leadership opportunities um, in here in this place. And there's a budget for that, and I'm thinking there's there's young men out there as well that need not that state opportunity. Budget item that's not funded by the state. Uh, well, I'm just saying that's what I not saw. Uh, sorry, I thought there was some leadership, young ladies so leadership not program. Young women to come to Parliament. That's a CWP project. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think um, what I have to stay, say at this point is I, I totally appreciate your comments, but I'm the Minister for Women. That is the portfolio. We are trying through this portfolio as a government to address the inequities that we have seen for many years. Um, with regard to men and women. So my focus through this portfolio is, is on women. And I think a really important um, thing to remember is that um, we know that um, communities prosper when there is that gender balance. We know that when women do well, men do well as well. Um, but I do have to be clear that this is um, the portfolio um, for women and we are trying to address the issues that we have had for generations around equality in that space. I'm not in any way trying to undermine um, what you're, where you're coming from. I, I totally accept that. But my focus and my job as the Minister for Women is to look at where are those imbalances, where is there that inequity, where is it that women are disadvantaged for no other reason than the fact that they are a woman. And that is um, where my focus is, acknowledging that when women, women prosper, um, men, when men prosper as well. No, thank you. So do you have another one? No. No. So just un under this role, uh, Minister, as um, Minister, Minister for Women, in terms of um, your role broadly across the whole public service, it sits under DPAC, um, which, you know, is the, um, the head of the state service sits here with you. Um, in terms of promoting gender equality, um, we know that um, respect for women is an integral part of um, gender equality. So what role do you have in this area in trying to promote respect um, for women uh, across the, the whole department, the whole of um, the workforce, our, our state workforce? You know, the respect sits at the, 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 well, the respect sits at the base of, at the, um, at the base of this. Um, so this government is committed to a state service workforce that is diverse, um, including where women are um, equitably represented. In 2016, heads of agencies set a target of women holding at least 40% of senior executive positions um, by 2020. Um, this was achieved well ahead of that time, and women now occupy 51.5% of senior executive roles, and that information is as of March. 2023, and it's based on a paid headcount. Um, under Safe Homes, Families and Communities, agencies undertake a range of activities related to gender equality, diversity and respect. And in October of 2020, um, this government committed to implementing the Our Watch Workplace Equality and Respect Standard, um, which will ensure workplace equality and respect um, continues to be prioritised. Uh, the 2020 State Service 
survey saw a 2% reduction of participating employees reporting that they had personally experienced workplace bullying in the 12 months prior to the survey. Um, although this reduction is positive, always any level of workplace bullying um, and harassment needs to continue to be prioritised um, and addressed. Um, and I'm just going to hand over to um, Miss Herworth for some more comments. I'll clarify my notes. Because I can't read your writing. That's the first time that happens. <laughs> um, yeah. So I also had an amazing opportunity um, where I was invited um, by the head of the state service to participate um, in a webinar, um, which was um, participants from right across the state service. It was a bit like um, being the guest speaker at a conference when I was only in the room with three other people. Um, everyone was online. Um, but it was an opportunity um, where... Um, um, Ms Gale just asked questions and I was able to speak to the entire state service or those who, who mm, wanted to be in. involved mm. in the webinar um, just to talk about my journey, um, my experiences here in the Legislative Council, my experiences as a minister, um, as a mother, a working mother, as a partner um, and... Um, that was that was really um, quite fantastic, and um, Jenny was oh, sorry. Miss Gale was the other guest speaker there, so um, we were sort of able to share our stories um, right across that sector. And it was I'm not sure um, if you can Miss Gale can remember the numbers that attended, but we were a bit overwhelmed as we saw hundred by hundred by hundred um, of people, five hundred um, actually tuned in to that to that webinar. Hmm. So, in terms of um, training or um, like educational, you talked about signing up to the Our Watch yeah. um, framework, is it? It's Our Watch Workplace um, Equality and Respect Standards. Standards, that's right. So, does that involve also like, um, training and um, awareness raising of those issues that, that, that sit below that standard? <laughs> So through you, yeah. through you, Minister, um, yes, it does, yeah. um, and it involves men and women. Yeah, yeah, so it's women, yeah. So it's across the state service. So, how many of the um, state service um, employees have actually undertaken the training? Um, we would have to take that on notice. We're actually um, just about to provide an annual report across the state service. That's not very far from being published. Oh, right. um, so, if you would. Uh, like to wait. That will tell have me about what's in the report. What, what can I expect in that report? Basic three units. It basically indicates um, what each agency is doing to uh, address the the workplace equality and respect standards in their agencies. <laughs> oh, okay, and that includes who's done or oh, not who by name, but the numbers that have done name. training and so, agenda breakdown of that. So through you, Premier, yeah. it probably won't. Yeah, Premier, you just, just elevate. Sorry, did I say? I'll give you pardon, Minister. Not from the other house. Promotion. Promotion <laughs> is happening. I'm suffering from okay. fatigue. Give it time. Give it time. Uh, so through you, Minister. Uh, it won't show tables um, of how many people have participated in training. It will indicate what kinds of training are, be are being done, what, co what programs there are and that kind of thing. Um, as with the budget, gender budget statement, it's, this will be the first year that we have reported mm -hmm. um, against the workplace uh, equality and respect standards, and um, we expect that the report will improve over time, but it's not far from being released. If it's not going to uh, actually identify the number of people across the department who have undertaken the training, I'd appreciate if you could do that, if that information is available prior to a bit later, Minister. Yeah, I don't. Okay, so we, we, the advice that I'm given is that we don't believe we're collecting that data at present. No. Why, why wouldn't you, This is an important measure. Like, I mean, I know this is an out, output, like a number of people have actually undertaken the training, but if you don't know how many people have undertaken it, um, then you can't measure outcomes from it. So we're not collecting that data in a systemic way? Yeah, so through you, Minister, um, each agency has their own workplace equality and respect action plan because there are significant differences in agencies in terms of culture, readiness, understanding, the, even the demographics of the workforce, education, very female, 
focus, you know, other agencies. Um, and so each agency is offering different training opportunities and different training packages based on their action plan, which was based on an assessment against the workplace equality and respect standards. So at this point in time, given where we're at with that, we're not collecting... Each agency will do data collection in different ways at this point in time and differently based on what sort of training they're offering. Some of the training might even be almost anonymous. Well, mm -hmm. You can attend without identifying that you're attending it because of the nature of some of the content of it. Um, so we we wouldn't be able to provide a meaningful system, um, idea across the whole state service. We may be able to provide some indication for DPAC itself mm -hmm. as an agency, but not state service-wide at this point in time. Yeah. Do you provide an indication for DPAC at least? I, is there an expectation, Minister, that um, each department will report this in the annual report, what they're doing in this space? Yeah. Uh -huh. so, through you, Minister, yes. it will be in, in the Workplace um, Equality and Respect Standards Annual Report, not each agency's annual report. Oh, right. yeah. So yeah. that will be an annual report, Minister, that comes out at the same time as all other annual reports come out? Um, through you, Minister, I expected it, all, it, well, it will be at a different time. We've almost got the first one ready to come out, right. so, um, so we won't wait until October right. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we mature, as I said, I'm trying to manage your expectations. As yeah. we get better at this, yeah. um, then we'll put it out at the same time each year. OK. Mm. Mm. And so um, one hopes in the future, like not first iteration necessarily, that there will be outcomes measures in that. Yes, three years. Yes, yes, we hope that there will be. Yeah. OK. All right. It, it all takes time and, you know, it's, we haven't done much of this for such a long time. It takes a while, while to turn the ship around. Mm. Are there questions on women's policy? No, mm. yes. One question on women's policy, just around leadership, and we've heard that women have been traditionally underrepresented. The government has made great strides in that, um, in that space, but there is a particular program called the I Lead Women in Industry program that you might like to make some comments around. Yeah, thank you very much. And this has um, been a, a great strategy um, designed, you know, specifically for uh, women. Uh, the I Lead Women in Industry tackles the underrepresentation of women in leadership positions and creates um, recipes for career success in traditionally male-dominated industries. The training is delivered online and in person by expert facilitators and prominent sector professionals who share their tried and trusted tried and tested strategies in their career success. So 42 applications were received in the 2022 iLEAD scholarship funding round with 37 selected to participate. We'll be evaluating the success of this investment but for now I would like to share um, the testimonies of some of these women. So Alicia said <clears throat> the iLEAD Women in Industry program helped me identify opportunities for improvement and provided me with several interesting learning learnings about myself. It was incredibly well run and varied and I would highly recommend this program to any leader or potential leader. From Melanie, I learnt adaptive management techniques to strengthen my work and leadership style and I formed connections with amazing women. This builds on my experience in other types of adaptive management such as conservation action planning and added many new skills. And from Tammy, I joined I Lead Women in Industry with an expectation of gaining insight into my personal strengths and how to leverage on these to drive change within industry. I have left with so much more than I could have anticipated. I now have a box of new tools to draw upon to assist in challenging situations along with a network of inspirational female leaders who I can reach out to and I know will understand my experiences. I now know I'm not alone on my journey to drive inclusivity, equal opportunity and better conditions in industry. I recommend I lead women in industry to all females working in traditionally male-dominated industries or your role within the industry. Leadership is a group action, is a group action, not a title. Break the shackles and re realise your potential. Um, and I think that in the words of, um, of those women, I couldn't have said it better. Anything else? No? All done? Okay. All right. Well, Mr. Rudd, it's a couple of minutes over uh, schedule break, so we'll um, finish up with women and we'll come back. 
at um, 1.45 uh, for Minister, under Minister for Disability Services. Thank you. Yes.